Uh, thank you, everybody. I lost my voice yesterday, but thankfully it's come back today, so um, bear with me. Uh, look, it's, it's a huge honor to be here in front of you today. I am, uh, I'm, I'm so uh, excited about all the things that we've achieved as a community, uh, and I really admire all the work that you've all done. Uh, and I'm really um, excited that I can share a lot of the work that we've been doing in the uh, Earthbite group at the University of Sydney um, in modeling the planetary carbon cycle um, on geological timescales. And of course, none of this would be possible without a really great, dynamic, talented team of people um, that you see here, but particularly the really talented and enthusiastic um, students that um, I've been lucky uh, to interact with. Now, I can't cover everything that we've done since 2015, uh, but Dietmar, who's in the audience here, he's got two posters and a talk on Sunday in Reservoirs and Fluxes, so I think we'll be able to cover most of the uh, findings. <clears throat> As we've heard today and yesterday, uh, I, I think it's fairly uh, obvious that plate tectonics is a really key uh, uh, life support system on the planet. It prevents this runaway uh, uh, greenhouse effect when you've got volcanic emissions into the atmosphere, they can be drawn down through silicate weathering um, of rocks and, and other processes on Earth. Um, and so I'll cover how we've used um, community open source software, uh, workflows and models to actually study the evolution of, of uh, this process. And so what you see here is one of our um, uh, older plate tectonic reconstructions but what, what you can see is the, the, the continents moving around, but also the plate boundaries evolving. These are open source uh, digital models, and we can interrogate them um, through time. So for example, here we've got time on the x-axis in millions of years, and this is subduction zone length through time, right? Um, and previous assumptions, previous studies have suggested that, well, if you can just look at subduction zone lengths or arc lengths, that can give you some proxy for, say, the, the slab flux, the amount of stuff that's going into the mantle. And if you look at the Cretaceous, we, we know that that was um, a, a, a greenhouse condition. And between 100 and 80 million years ago, there seems to be a, a elevated subduction zone lengths. And so um, other people have done similar things, in, in this case, using seismic tomography sections, um, uh, linking um, uh, subduction zone lengths, arc lengths, to slab flux um, as a proxy for how much material you're bringing into the mantle. So we took this a step further with um, talented student Madison East by actually looking at the convergence rate across the subduction zone. So you see the different shades of blue. Darker blue means more material being subducted through time. What you're seeing is that this process is evolving through time and it varies even a along a single subduction zone. <clears throat> Uh, and, and what really surprised us was that the uh, subduction zone length did not really correlate to the subducting plate area, which is the amount of stuff that you're putting into the mantle, whether it's sediment or oceanic crust with volatiles in it. And in fact, it, it seems to have this weak negative correlation. So it seems that subduction zone lengths aren't a, a, a entirely reliable um, proxy for, for slab flux. And more so, what's really interesting, when you look at the time series, so here is time now going uh, forward in, in this direction, um, we now have a subducting plate area or slab flux peak from this analysis at 130 million years ago, not between 100 and 80 million years ago. And what's really interesting here is that it explains a number of things. First of all, it explains uh, the eruption of many large igneous provinces uh, and uh, some of these kimberlites uh, in um, Africa. <clears throat> and the idea is that the more slab material you are uh, subducting, it sinks into the lower mantle, it perturbs the lower mantle and triggers Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities, which are these plumes that erupt on the surface. And this process in the Cretaceous has also been implicated in being responsible for a magmatic flare-up event. So I think there's a lot of uh, consistency here. And we can actually see this as well in our geodynamic models. You can see the blue things are the slabs that are sinking. But by 120 MA, you have many of these mantle plumes actually uh, erupting as a result of some of this um, accelerated convergence that you get um, uh, along the subduction zones here. 
And so these plumes erupt a lot of basalt. We know that, so the Siberian traps, Deccan traps, uh, releasing a lot of CO2 uh, and often perturbing the global uh, carbon cycle and sometimes triggering mass extinctions. And so from the plate reconstructions, we can actually track the area of these uh, erupted uh, uh, plateaus um, um, and, and figure, estimate how much CO2 may have been released. Uh, but we can also uh, estimate how they may have been eroded through the silicate weathering process, how much CO2 drawdown would have occurred, uh, particularly in this near equatorial humid belt. Um, yesterday, someone mentioned this idea of dark data. So the, the, another analysis that we undertook was uh, looking at carbonate platforms. Um, and, and the idea is that, well, there, there was a great data set by Kiesling et al, 2003. We'll link that up to our plate reconstructions to really track through time the potential interactions between volcanic arcs and the um, carbonate platforms in the crust. And so this is what that animation looks like. Uh, we can uh, figure out the distance between the trench, uh, the subduction zone, and, and, and these carbonate platforms. Um, and, and this seems to indicate that, for example, the closure of the Tethian Ocean Basin uh, was really important in uh, uh, devolatilization um, uh, reactions. To take this further, one thing we want to do is actually uh, model the growth of reefs and carbonate platforms on continental margin in the context of changing sea level. So you see here in pink, these are the uh, uh, reefs of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Um, uh, so yeah, in the, the growing of these reefs in the context of sea level, but also terrestrial uh, sediment um, um, input from erosion uh, and weathering. Uh, so that's, that's kind of where we're going because this at least gives us an idea of, of the thickness of the carbonate platforms and how much carbon they may actually be storing. And this is uh, software developed by uh, Tristan Sal. Um, and the idea is to take this in a, in a global uh, direction to, to be able to, to uh, have plate reconstructions, um, um, moving the continents around, incorporating paleogeography, uh, mantle flow, uh, paleoclimate and precipitation to have a better idea of silicate weathering through time. Um, and, and I think that's going to be uh, really, uh, really important. Uh, in the near term, one thing we want to, uh, one thing we're already doing actually is looking at mountains. Right, the, the uplift of mountains uh, causes metamorphic uh, degassing um, uh, in suture zones, but also the weathering uh, of, of mountains, the silicate weathering in the near equatorial humid belts uh, is, is actually really important through time. Um, with Dietmar and, and the team at Earthbite, we've developed the first deforming plate tectonic reconstruction. So we can actually start thinking about also um, using the deformation histories from these models to supplement these paleogeographic maps uh, through time. Uh, another thing that we've been working on for many years, it's, it feels very tedious, but I think very important, is a, a, a database on ophiolites. Okay? Ophiolites is oceanic crust that's been abducted or thrust up onto the continent. And it often, the abduction process often um, uh, is accompanied by uh, the cessation of subduction, Okay, so one of the, the carbon taps switches off. And these ophiolites, when uh, exposed to subaerial weathering, uh, are also powerful sinks of carbon through weathering. So one of the key things about this database that we're building is, is that we want to capture the uh, origin or the formation age of the ophiolite, but also the abduction age. Okay? And so far we have um, almost 4,000 data points, but, but really only about 1,200 uh, data points that have both of those ages. Now, what um, this graph in the background just shows is, is kind of a byproduct of, of this database, which is telling us um, the, the, the maximum time between the formation and abduction time of these ophiolites. And so you can see the max, it, it kind of ranges between zero and 300 million years. And I think he, in here is embedded um, uh, it, it just, just a, a, a proxy of the longevity of ocean basins or uh, back arc basins uh, in, in the world. So um, there's been a lot of work in the DCO uh, 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 compiling 
the tectonic fluxes at the present day. Okay, this was summarized uh, by uh, Wang et al. Uh, this year. Um, what we did in, in this study with Kevin and Marie and, and Emily and others who are in the audience um, is extrapolated these present day values uh, into the past using the plate reconstructions. Okay? Now, this is fraught with danger because there's so many uncertainties. Uh, what, what really is interesting is that there are um, processes that are not uniformitarian processes, right? Uh, for example, the calcium carbonate sediments on the seafloor, that's really only um, started in the last 200 million years uh, as a result of the evolution of um, uh, uh, marine calcifiers, right? And we already talked about uh, uh, convergence rates and subduction that, that has varied through time as well. So this is really, I see, as a first step in, in, a, in a direction, but, but there's going to be uh, more work uh, needed. Um, so I'm not going to dwell too much on this, but essentially through our um, uh, modeling and, and software, which again is all free and uh, available to the community, we've been able to explore the different tectonic settings uh, and how they actually uh, relate to um, um, uh, the deep carbon cycle. So uh, to conclude, I think uh, one of the great philosophies uh, behind the Deep Carbon Observatory is this idea of sharing science, sharing knowledge, um, and uh, Dietmar and others have been pioneering this open science um, uh, initiative. And I think that's really powerful going forward, particularly now that we've collected so much data through the DCO. I think there's going to be a really exciting five to 10 year period of actually extracting knowledge from this fantastic new data. Um, and to summarize just some of the findings here that um, subduction arc lengths themselves are probably not the best indicators of slab flux in terms of what's how much material is going down. However, I, I still think they're very useful because they at least tell you where the tap of that carbon uh, release is, is coming through. Um, tectonic exchanges of carbon vary through time. We saw that the uh, slab flux has changed through time. And it's also punctuated by sharp perturbations. So things like mantle plume uh, eruptions that, that um, uh, we saw here. Um, and, and I've already summarized um, uh, our near future goals, and I'm uh, really excited to uh, embark on the next 10 years of the Deep Carbon Observatory, and I'd like to thank the DCO and the Sloan Foundation for all their support, particularly in supporting early career researchers. So thank you very much. Questions? Thank you very much. A really exciting talk and really bringing together things from all over DCO to uh, try and understand how things have worked in the past. Do we have any questions? Uh, yet, like yesterday, if you can go to the mic, form an orderly queue if necessary. Um, Bob. Ben, thank you. That's so inspirational. Do you have any intuition as why when the length of arc is greater that the amount of total input is less? Does it have to do with the fact you're in more oceans or it's slower? What, what, what's the correlation there? Yes, it's, it's, really, it's really odd. I think it's to do with uh, the, the uh, slab pull forces, right? Um, um, so, so when you have really long subduction zones, you've got uh, a, a really big slabs that are pulling the, the plates down, right? So think of the Pacific plate um, uh, that's being subducted. Whereas if you have lots of smaller plates, you have really long subduction subduction zones, but you may not have strong slab pull. I mean, that's just my gut in intuition. We haven't looked at that further, but, but that's, that's something that we can do with pure geodynamic models that aren't forced with the reconstructions, and that would be really interesting to explore, actually. Yeah. Any further questions? Okay, well, let's uh, thank you again for a wonderful talk. Yeah.